Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Hello, hello, all you wonderful friends. Thank you for revisiting in the lead up to the release of the Lost Metal. We have a couple of these, we'll call it a preview series, a preview for the Lost Metal. And if any of you are interested in full rereads, still time to join over on Patreon, where Book Club is looking at Owl of Law, Shadows of Self, and Bands of Mourning in greater detail. Of course, you can also scroll back in our catalog and listen to our rereads from a few years ago as well. Today, we have sort of a a grab bag. We've got a few different things we're talking about. We're going to start with the Southern Skadrians because we have not really drilled down on this culture yet and taken a look at everything we know about the Southern Skadrians who may start to play a much bigger part in the stories that we see on Scadrial. And perhaps even the stories beyond Scadrial or yeah, in Scadrial's future. What is so interesting to me is that it's easy to miss the depth that is indicated regarding the Southern Scadrians and just how much information we do get, even though yeah. they are a relatively small part of the Bands of Mourning, and we clearly don't have the Lost Metal yet. And so... They didn't appear for very long in the series, and yet we do have a lot of information about them. Yeah, we learn quite a bit, and I think I tend to forget about it because it's happening in the middle of all the action. All the action, yeah. Uh, so it was really nice to go through and like pull out all of this info and see how much we really do know about them, which also, of course, just highlights everything that we don't yet know. And the questions that we want yeah. answered. So we're going to go bit by bit through kind of starting with culture, religion, and then how these Southern Scadrians may influence the Lost Metal as well as the Greater Cosmere. But let's kind of just give a broad overview right now, a little bit about their history, their creation mythology. Yeah, well, the their actual creation, whether it's a myth or not, they were placed on the South Pole of the planet by the Lord Ruler when he first ascended. And he put them there as like a control group for the experiments that he was doing with the Ska in the part of Scadrial that we see. I thought that was really interesting because, of course, he changed the genetics of the Ska to be able to withstand the Ash Falls more easily. And I think there's a couple other things that he changes in them as well. And then he puts this other group of people down on the South Pole with no ash or anything to protect them from the hotter temperatures on the planet. And they adapt. They change over time. They evolve. This is one of the kind of big mysteries uh, about the Southern Scadrians. What were they doing during the Lord Ruler's time? How did that lead to the development of their society after Harmony's ascension and the remaking of the world? And then the we need to like fill in all of the pieces because we have little snippets from the Southern Scadrian history. So just this concept that they actually might be more real or they might be more historically accurate to what Scadrians were like Mm. prior to the Lord Ruler coming to power. They might be more in the form that Ruin and Preservation originally Mm -hmm. created, because they created all things on Scadrial. Not true across the Cosmere, but everything was created by Ruin and Preservation. The Southern Scadrians are a little bit like preserved of that. And I think it's so funny that from the time of the Lord Ruler, the Southern Scadrians had this opportunity to develop and adapt, like you said, yeah, in a way that we did not see. And I find that so interesting that the Lord Ruler decided to preserve this control group totally. 
So the Southern Scadrians, they can be broken up into five distinct nations that sort of each have their own societies and structures within them. Each tribe does have a mask wearing tradition, which is kind of their most noticeable attribute. But between the nations, the different mask wearing traditions also vary, which is interesting. There's also a group called the deniers of masks. And they're in opposition in some way to the other Southern Scadrians. And Alec says that they are really dangerous. And Wax and Marasi are like, oh, you mean like us? You know, like we don't wear masks. And he's like, no, you're just barbarians. But the deniers of masks are like legit. Like we are scared of them. They're scary. Which I thought was really interesting. Of course. Like who are they? What did they do? And what is the challenge that they represent clearly with the name like deniers of mass this mask wearing culture is unique and i'm wondering when the historical development of the southern scadrians began and did it continue after in terms of wearing masks in terms of wearing masks and these five like distinct nations Mm, hypothetically i could imagine lord ruler's time he puts a group of what were then just like people down in the South Pole doesn't manipulate them in the same way. From there, they could develop five distinct nations Mm -hmm. or they could have begun to develop five distinct nations after Harmony's ascension because that would have been like a cataclysm in their society. No, my impression is that these five nations were established before the Catacentra. The Catacentra brought about the ice death for them. So that was like a another different, mythology kind of thing. Yeah, a different thing. But in terms of the deniers of masks to sort of highlight the intensity of the conflict that they have with this group, the whole reason that they want the bands of mourning, like all of this power is in order to fight the deniers of masks. Yes, so much of the motivation of the Southern Scadrians is about this conflict, possible mm-hmm. war, between the mask-wearing cultures, the five nations, and the deniers of masks. In my mind, I kind of see them like a Wakanda-esque situation. You know how Wakanda was ruled by the Black Panther? Like the Southern Scadrians are yeah. the Wakanda Knights? Yes, the Wakandians. They have that division that is historical between like the tribes that are represented by the different animals uh-huh. for them. Yeah. And that's kind of what I see the Southern Scadrians like, you know, still we are Wakanda, but we're also divided along these yeah. lines. Mm-hmm. And I think that's right. The deniers of the mass to me represent a rejection of the Wakanda lifestyle, the Southern Scadrian lifestyle. So to continue and conclude my analogy, it would be like Killmonger, who is rejecting some aspects of Wakanda. Well, not just rejecting, but like actively trying to undermine, destroy, or change. And he's just like, I'm in charge now. The deniers of mass could be representing that. Like all y'all are bad with your mask wearing culture. It's a, maybe they have a, you know, a legitimate kind of, qualm with the five nations well it seems like they would also need to be equipped with some type of weapons or power of some kind that the southern scadrians struggle to combat yes to counteract that made them a threat and i think that's really the question of the lost metal possibly of what makes the southern scadrians specifically these deniers a mask so difficult to deal with may be their ability to control the lost metal, which... Are they the seafaring people that we heard about in the broadsheets? I would say, just because we talked about that last episode, I think that I would say no. I would say Southern Scadrians are all in one group, and the people of the ocean are actually in another group. Yeah, but what if the deniers of masks are the ocean people? I think that's a good call in terms of like, that makes sense. It's, Mm -hmm. but I'm just going to lean towards no. I'm going to take the more difficult bet that there's another group that we don't even know about. Yeah. And the fight that we are seeing 
break out and this instigation for the Malwish tribe to come north seeking the bands of mourning is really like an internal fight kind of that's like spilled over and forced them outwards. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the different nations within the Southern Skadrians because you mentioned the Malwish, mm-hmm. which is uh, Alex people group yeah his nation so this is the majority of the southern scadrons that we've seen so far represented in bands of mourning they wear red masks and their masks can change according to either their profession or their mood and we know that dance is a really important part of their culture as well now we don't have much information about any of these nations we don't even have the name of (laughs) all five of them but the main speaker or like our main window into the southern scadrians comes through alec and his culture of the malwish and i think that's important is that we are going to be discovering the southern scadrians through a lens or through a window yeah. that's presented through like Malwish lens. Mm-hmm. And we need to be aware of that because they're going to have interpretations of each of the other nations and the deniers of the mass that may or may not be true, or it may be a, a refracted right. truth that's kind of manipulated by these intricate histories. What I wanted to ask you about is speculation time. Let's go into some crazy speculation early on in the podcast do you think that the dance and music could be a risharian connection no okay fair (laughs) enough fair enough (laughs) no i don't i mean i think that there is a an overriding connection with sound or like waves in general in the Cosmere that connects everything, but not specifically this culture necessarily. Okay. I think the mask wearing and the dancing that the Malwish seem to represent as like important in their society is telling if at the same time they were limited until the big events of meeting the sovereign and mm-hmm. you know post harmony if they didn't have access to the investiture of scadriel i don't know that for 100 percent certain oh. if during the lord ruler time well, they were withheld or you know no magic got to them because I of the lord ruler don't think that's the case because when the sovereign comes which maybe we should just talk about this when we get to the sovereign yeah we're gonna speak in a lot more detail about the sovereign and that interactions he has with the southern scadrians and i don't want to get too far ahead yeah let's talk about the other nation within the southern scadrians that we hear about and that is the hunters this is the the next seemingly like the next biggest or the next most prestigious Mm -hmm. nation with the Malwish and the hunters have again a different mask culture and their culture each person receives one mask at birth which is then replaced by a second mask upon reaching adulthood that second mask eventually grows into their skin it becomes like embedded into them because they are always wearing it and so possibly Ayatil Mraze's master, who is Southern Scadrian, is potentially of hunter ancestry because we do see, or I think Shalon mentions that it almost looks like the mask is like embedded into her face, like carapace. Really great call out there. And I think that it's important to recognize why would Ayatil be in that situation? And it's because of the Catacendra and how they experience that, which is they have renamed it the ice death. I see it as like the great flood, but for them of ice. And that moment, that cataclysmic moment becomes the changing point for all of their societies, but the hunters specifically, they previously had been the society's warriors, fighters, and probably, you know, legitimately hunters. Hunters, yeah. <laughs> But after the ice death, their mindset changes and they become more like 
scholars mixed with a little Indiana Jones Yeah, elements. Indiana Jones, definitely. And so they're going out searching for knowledge and to gain information for their tribe and maybe mm-hmm. bring that back. And I think that change yeah. is important. That's interesting because then I wonder if that is the uh, impetus or like the reason why the Southern Scadrians and maybe specifically the hunters found a way into the cognitive realm and found a way to Silverlight leading to Ayatel being born in Silverlight. It would definitely make sense if they were like the the feelers of the Southern Scadrian going out and exploring, stretching out. We know that Silverlight exists, which means we know there's got to be pathways to get there. And if you're going out and searching, you're going to follow the... We don't know the timeline specifically for when Silverlight is created and when the Southern Scadrians would have gained access to it. So all speculation, but very interesting questions. The other thing about the hunters is that they are the group that took an airship in order to find the bands of mourning and destroy them. So they have a a different perspective on this potential weapon than the Malwish, for example, who are like, hey, we could use this to destroy the deniers of masks. And the hunters just want to destroy the bands of mourning altogether. We'll talk about which we think should be done or what (laughs) avenue you should take with the bands of mourning. But that's the limit of our named knowledge on these five nations within the Southern Scadrians. Ali mentions the others, and I would assume that they are just as unique and just as significant. Yeah. It will be interesting to experience, and hopefully we get a lot more experiences, with the Southern Scadrians and their culture and the way that they've developed their society over time. Because, of course, one of the most unique aspects of their presence in this story is their use of technology. But before we get into that in depth, I want to talk about like the base level, which is the religion or their way that they structure their society more intimately. Yeah, because they have sort of a similar like two step um, philosophical background, similar to the people in the basin who, of course, originally have like the Lord Ruler and Ruin and Preservation. And then obviously after the Catacendra, now they have harmony and like a sort of different uh, step of philosophy. And similarly, in the Southern Skadrians, their sort of base level religion or philosophy is that they worship the Jägenmeier, which is an entity that is composed of two beings who are both one being and also two beings that are like always together and yet are separate. <laughs> Yeah. So very straightforward. I believe that's difficult to understand, but but important to say they are always together and always apart. Yeah, it's like a yin-yang symbol, which is two parts, but also it's like one thing. Completely understood. Now, that does remind me a little bit of Ruin and Preservation, but let's go even deeper into the story because the Jägenmeier is made up of hair, and his sister slash wife. Yeah. Because that's how gods be like. His sister wife name is... Fru. Excellent pronunciation. <laughs> and hair makes things go while Fru makes things stop. And neither can make a life on their own. Yes. So they have to work together in order to make life. We have stop. We have go. Obviously... This is a paradigm, a way to understand the shards of ruin and preservation. So as we see a lot in the Cosmere, the in-world religions have grains of truth for what is actually happening in the world. And we see that here as well. However, when the ice death happens, the Catacendra happens, the Southern Scadrians you know, need sort of an explanation for why this happens. And so they blame their kings, the people who were in power at the time. And their explanation is that the kings did something to offend the Jägenmeier, which caused this ice death. And so those kings, those people who were in power at the time have been 
excommunicated, basically, from all of their tribes into their own little group that is called the Fallen. And those people are required to wear plain white masks, and they can earn a more ornate mask if they do some great deed. So they are able to, like, earn their place back in the Southern Scadrians, but for now, they have been shunned to the side. Yeah, a real bummer for just being the victim of Harmony coming to power. Yeah. It seems like the Southern Scadrians were able to build a functioning society, you know, to find that how you want, but a functioning society without the Lord Ruler's help or intervention. And then Harmony comes along and is just like, boom, boom, boom. Now you have ice death. And everyone that He's like, oh, I fixed everything. And the Southern Scadrians are like, WTF, we were fine, dude. You made the fallen happen. (laughs) I like that they can earn their way back. I'm not so sure about the whole excommunication thing in the first place, but at least they give a path back. I guess my biggest question is like, if Harmony, you know, when Harmony ascended, when Sazed ascended, he would have immediately like known or sensed or something that the southern scadrians were there you know like i would think Mm -hmm. that sort of immediately he would have a download of information of like oh dang there's this whole group of people that like we never knew about and they're on the south pole and they are living it up in a super hot climate that they have adapted to and like why like, yeah, like my that question is, yeah, like why didn't Harmony help them? Why did he quote unquote fix Scadriel, putting it back in its correct orbit and whatnot, mm. and then just like not help them? And then they were like literally freezing to death until Kelsier had to show up and be like, "I'll help you." That is a very interesting like, WTF, question. WTF, Harmony? Why is Harmony so bad at yeah. his job? He was just like, "I only care about my people." These people on the South Pole can die. (laughs) Now, we've talked about this a couple of times, and I keep coming back to the same basic problem, which is that Harmony right now is doing things wrong, in my opinion. I think that's what the books are trying to hint at. Even Mm -hmm. though we liked Zay's, Harmony is failing in some kind of key way, unable to stop his own creations in shadows Mm -hmm. of self unable to see what is going on in much of the bands of mourning and the lost metal we know his hashtag all spoilers all the time but we know from that little preview summary that we saw that there's a countdown period that basically harmony doesn't have the ability to see in the future after a certain amount of time yeah and that's the whole clock on the lost metals we need to solve the mystery before that clock runs out and i am very much of the opinion that harmony kept making mistakes because he loved and because he was too connected to the people around him in his immediate vicinity interesting because this whole thing is like Mm non-intervention but he intervened so much on behalf of his people the yes. people in the basin and then was truly non-interventionalist with the southern scadrians and i feel like both of those things were like the wrong thing to do like maybe you shouldn't have intervened so much in the basin like mm-hmm. you know just leave it alone don't make it the garden of eden maybe and then like maybe you should have helped the southern scadrians like at least make them not freeze to death i think that he definitely should have and that maybe he was unable to because of his strange balancing act that he has to perform his personal motivation makes him so focused on the ellendale basin but that has to come from somewhere right it has to be balanced out by something and the something is rejection or ignorance of the southern scadrians to help them out would be to lower the amount of time, energy, power, shard ability that he could give to the Ellendale Basin. Hmm. And he's misaligned. He's in disharmony yeah. himself yeah. because he wants to help Ellendale Basin so much. Or like, I mean, who knows how time works for mm-hmm. a shard. Maybe, you know, he used a bunch of power on the basin emotionally when he first ascended and did it like too quickly to mm-hmm. realize and then finally realized like, 
hmm, maybe I did too much. I probably shouldn't do anything else now. And then like stopped before he got to the Southern Scadrians, basically. Yes, exactly the problem that comes up with any laissez-faire type of philosophy. Here, we're kind of having a giving of power, giving of attention to the Elendelians and an ignorance of the Southern Scadrians. And yet that doesn't lead to their destruction. In fact, yeah. it leads well, to a greater ability to technologically innovate, it seems, in some ways. But only because of Kelsier. Okay, and we're like just about to get there. One other just sort of interesting thing about their culture that I want to note before we move on is mm-hmm. because they, the Southern Scadrians have a very low body temperature and are adapted to that super warm climate, they believe that hell is in the sky because they're like, Earth is warm, therefore good. Yes. Therefore, hell must be the opposite direction, aka in the sky. Which to me makes way more sense, especially if you then take the sky and then after that it's space. And space is terrifying. <laughs> like that is the most hellish that's environment. That's actually really true, especially since we like bury people in the earth. Yeah. That's... It seems like, yeah, we would be like, earth is like the good place. Yeah. You put them down lower yeah, and they will be happier where, there. Yeah. Where they're going to- Nice and warm. Yeah. Be saved- Saved in the earth, this like planet that gives us life and produces food. Yes, we're very dwarven, you know, of the rock and the fire. (laughs) And yet. And yet. (laughs) I think that's important to remember, though, that this biology that's been going on with the Southern Scadrians is slightly confusing because we need to remember that during Mistborn Era 1, the planet is wildly too close to the sun. Yes, because of Lord Ruler mistakes. That's the whole reason for the ash mounts. Exactly. And they don't have the ash mounts covering up the sky. Yeah. So they're just hyper capable of surviving basically, you know, a, a species on Venus or something like that, where they're just they're in a different, a completely different world functionally from what yeah. we see in Mistborn Era One. Yeah. And in Mistborn Era Two they get some help to reverse that trend and to develop technologies that will allow them to overcome their natural biological limits. So this brings us to their sort of second wave of religion slash philosophy, Mm -hmm. where they also sort of worship the sovereign, which is their name for Kelsier, who the basin is now recognizing as the Lord Ruler. And here's a conversation between Alec and Wax sort of talking about how this happens. Quote, The Sovereign was our king from three centuries ago. He told us he was your king first and your god. The Lord Ruler, Waxilium said? He died. Yes, Alec said. He told us that too. 300 years ago, Waxilium said. Exactly? 330, Persistent One. Waxilium shook his head. That's after Harmony ascended. Are you sure about those dates? Of course I'm sure, Alec said. End quote. So. We have a hard date, and we don't often get hard dates. So that's a really important call. So we know that approximately 30 years after the events of the end of Mistborn Era 1, Kelsier has figured out how to come back. And he comes back with other people as well. Like he arrives with his quote unquote priests or like he has attendants. Like they're, he's got a posse when he comes back to Scadriel. I think that's important to remember that we leave Kelsier in Mistborn Era 1 or at least Mistborn Secret History as well. Right, yeah. With that connection to Spook looking into hemallergy. But what's important to remember is that Spook goes on to live as the Lord Mistborn right. for the next hundred years. Spook is really unnaturally long lived oh. and rules over Elendel Basin uh-huh. for a hundred years. Hmm. It is during that time that Kelsier returns. Yeah. And so we have a lot of crossover that is potentially happening at that time that we don't really know yeah. all the different pieces that are moving around but i think that it's that first century after harmony's ascension we probably have you know power grabs from lord mistborn kelsier marsh 
and harmony introducing other things I mean, like the southern scadrians it's i just don't like, know um, how much they're really like fighting for power you know like harmony is definitely the shard oh of so course i don't like mean he's fighting with fighting, spook. fighting. <laughs> yeah but i think it's that element that we have mentioned previously harmony's conundrum that basically marsh maybe shouldn't exist or shouldn't be able to disagree with harmony as he is functionally like a full slave of harmony but harmony's existence necessitates some type of ability for marsh to think on his own or to go against him and i think that's kind of what all of these characters may be representing is that because harmony wants to do x he has to have he has to allow for the existence of y in the form of the sovereign maybe and that's speculation yeah we still have so many questions about how what what Kelsier is up to and how he is doing the things that he's doing but he shows up in southern scadrial and he teaches the people there to revere metalborn people and basically tells them a little again a little bit of like truth which is that uh they the metalborn have a small sliver of god basically or like god power inside them Mm -hmm. and he teaches them um how to create the medallions and how to be warm enough to not die in the ice death and then he well part of their belief or like their quasi worship of the sovereign is that he created the bands of mourning and then he hid them in the mountains and like he will come again and he'll need the bands at that time. That's sort of their mythology around them. Now, some of the Southern Scadrians did see the hiding of the bands as kind of a test from the sovereign, a way to prove their loyalty, prove their ability, prove their worship of him, and to seek out the bands is a way to demonstrate their fealty. Are they good enough to find where he hid them? But that's contradicted by what we talked about with the hunters earlier who want to destroy the bands themselves, prevent anyone from using them. Yeah. So there's a lot of conflicting sort of aspects to this mythology that, again, are different depending on which nation of the Southern Scadrians we're talking about. Let's get into a little bit more of the technology that the Sovereign teaches them how to make, because this is sort of the the biggest thing that they have to offer Scadrill as a whole. Certainly the most important thing that we know of regarding the Southern Scadrians, for all the reasons we just talked about with their biology, is that ability to create the heat generating or heat storing medallions necessary for their existence outside of the the small pocket that they have called their homeland and certainly necessary to travel into the basin and the mountains that we see them in bands of mourning. Yeah. And so when Kelsier arrives with his little posse, he either builds or already has some form of technology that they call an excisor. So it is some type of technology that allows them to create those medallions, that allows a metal-born person to pass their ability or like to store their ability inside of an unkeyed metal mine mm-hmm. that can then be used as the medallion and we don't really know exactly what these excisors are or how kelsier discovered them and created them or anything like that but because he brings these excisors to them he really only teaches them how to create the heat medallions so that they can survive and they learn they sort of reverse engineer that technology to learn how to create other types of medallions and then go on to create all of the technology that we end up seeing from them so let's begin there with these excisors because i want us to connect them to the technology we see in misborn secret history presented by 
who we believe are oh, the Selish people. The Iri? Yes, the Iri, people from Sel. That's have interesting. The devices, we know that they're using multiple devices, mm-hmm. assuming using Aeons to kind of bring power from Cell to protect their little castle in mm-hmm. the cognitive realm. But they also have the device that's kind of like a intricate cage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it has the orb it's in the center. Kind of like a Fabriel. Exactly. From yes, and that to me is the best starting point for what an exciser is. That Kelsier's experience, because remember, he in Mistborn Secret History uses one of the Iris devices to channel the power of preservation when Fuzz dies, and then yeah. he's holding that and needs to get it to Vin later in her story. So it's like a... I mean, I think that's kind of different, though. It's just described as like an orb. Correct. And And so it's like... It doesn't seem like there's really anything that he needs to do. You know, he's not like pushing buttons and like figuring out... Absolutely, 100%. ...how to do it. But he would have, at that moment, known that there was some type of technological device that is helping him out, that thing that he stole from the Irie. Yeah. And then B, he has limitless exposure to the power of the shard and see he comes out of that experience bringing the excisers to the southern scadrians so to me it just makes sense that like one two three he learns you something think he just like learned how to do it when he knew he it was possible power. yes exactly he like understood more about what that piece of technology was or he understand more about what the people of the irie are doing and then with that new knowledge yeah He created something that was an exciser. My concept is that this is like a brutal hemallergic way instead of a ferrochemical way at first. And that the better version, the cube versions, and certainly the medallions that we see later is a more perfected version. But I could imagine them starting with hemallergy. Maybe Kelsier started with hemallergy, but I don't see him bringing... Like, I don't think the excisers that he brought to the Southern Scadrians were hemallergy. I don't imagine they would have taken kindly to, like, sure, just kill a bunch of our people so that other people can live. Like, I don't don't think that would go over very well. I also don't think that would go (laughs) over well. Not a good introduction method. Yeah. But if he arrived with a bunch of heat medallions and was able to hand those out to help people survive, he had to get the power from somewhere. Where'd that power come from? Question. Well, question. he didn't bring the medallions. He brought the excisers. And like, Sorry, that's it what was, I meant. The yeah, it was definitely a like teach a man to fish scenario. It was not a bringing of fish to them. He was like, hey, I'm going to show you how to do this. And from that, they developed yeah. all of the medallions. Exactly. Like, it worked exactly the way the, uh, the proverb says. <laughs> Let's discuss the medallions in a little bit more detail. I know that we have taken time to speak about them in the way that the powers operate, how those combinations can be incredibly useful and new, you know, make new combinations of things we haven't necessarily seen before. But it's important to remember that each of the medallions is twofold. There are well, always... They, they can make single medallions. The ones that we a... see are usually two attributes. Sorry, there's two things that I'm talking about. The actual metals that are necessary oh, and got it. the powers that are bestowed. So I right. think that so you have the to simplest, have the necrosol. Yes, the simplest medallion will always have two metals. Yeah. And that will bestow one power. Yeah. If you add a tertiary metal, that gets you two powers. Correct. I don't want to be overly confusing by just throwing numbers at people, but that's important to understand is there's always a base level of necrosil, which is the investiture. Right. Because in order for anyone to be able to use the medallion, you have to first make them a metal born person, essentially, which is what the investiture part does. And then they have the ability to tap whichever other metal mind is attached on the medallion. So they've gotten to the point where they can put a maximum of two powers in each medallion 
there are some medallions that have three powers, but they are extremely rare because they are very, very hard to make. And Alec tells us that every attempt to make a medallion with more than three, so four or more, has failed. And they cannot use multiple medallions at one time. You can only wear one medallion at a time because in some way they interfere with each other. So there is sort of an upper limit to the effectiveness of these medallions. The medallions can't become the bands of mourning. Exactly. You can't make a mistborn with these medallions. What I find interesting with the medallions is, you know, Brandon always loves his limits on the magic systems. But I am curious, you know, what is the actual limit that they are coming up against when the medallions have multiple powers? Is that a physical limit that can be overcome? Or is that a hard limit that will continue in the future? Like, we could we theoretically see a medallion swapping misborn, for lack of a better term, in the far oh. future? Someone who like has 10 medallions, but they have to move them in and out of rotation because they're not actually sure. misborn. They mm-hmm. just have these medallions to technologically help them. Yeah, they just keep going with this technology and find a way to technologically switch them. Yeah, quickly, swap them quickly like a, a Batman. But it, every time he is using his utility belt, it's like swapping in new medallions so that he has powers for the specific moment. I think that could be you know, a possible future. But I'm really interested to see like what is the reason for these limits because right now even a three power medallion would be better than anything we've seen in era two in regards to like we've seen twin borns wax yeah has two powers one allomancy one ferrucumi and if you could add one more so give wax one more power that would be incredibly potent yeah. I'm wondering if certain powers could work better together, if it has something to do with like, you need oh. a pushing and a pulling, or you need ones that hmm. can't all be too close or too yeah. connected. I'm interested to see like, what are the balances of all these different well, things? Well, it's interesting to think about like, what is the difference between these medallions and the bands of mourning? You mm. know, like, what was the difference in creation between those things. Because I think that there is some some aspect of these medallions being like an analog solution. Like they're a typewriter, right? Like they, they sort of do the job, but in a really rudimentary way. And there's something about the way that they are being manufactured that is not um, capitalizing on the full potential. Yes. Yeah, Whereas... Yeah, the bands of mourning are, you know, our smartphones. <laughs> exactly. It's not just a computer where you can be like, okay, well, typewriter, computer. It's right. a completely yeah. new yeah, bit yeah. of where you're just staring at like a brick. Like under- so what? far away from a typewriter. The bands of mourning certainly are a completely separate piece of technology, but it makes sense. And this is one of the theories about like Area 51 and how did humans get their Mm. technology in the first place. But if we saw something way more advanced, like an alien spaceship at Area 51, (laughs) we could make guesses based on what we saw. We couldn't Mm -hmm. copy it exactly because they're just too advanced, but we could like make huge jumps in our own technological Mm -hmm. development. That seems what the Southern Skadrains were basically exposed to. They saw an alien magical power in the the bands of mourning. Yeah, exactly. And the best they could do was the analog copy medallions. Yeah. Of course, another important contribution that the Southern Skadrians make to our general body of knowledge on Skadriel is a new metal, what they call et metal, which can also be called harmonium. And there's some really interesting info about this metal. I think this is going to be super important as we go into the lost metal because ruin and preservation's intents have been merged together into harmony. Et metal's spiritual aspect is in opposition with itself, which means that in its physical aspect, it is extremely reactive, which is what we see from it. Experience. If you put, yeah, like any water on it or anything, it immediately explodes, basically. <laughs> and there's a really interesting 
word of Brandon all about this. It's kind of long, but do you want to read it with me? I definitely want to read that with you, but let's preface that word of Brandon just a bit more by reminding people that Ep metal is used by the Southern Scadrians as their combustion power. It is their oil and fuel source for their flying machines, and we believe for much of their society at large. They may have like energy reactors, you know, that are powering sure. yeah. different devices all around their society. We want more exploration of that. But Ed Metal is a thing we do not see anywhere in the Ellendale Basin. Right. Even exactly. by something like the set, who's clearly looking for all of these weird aspects. Yeah, totally. Well, and Et Metal is the thing, the part of the weapon that the hunters bring with them to destroy the bands of mourning. They have this very powerful bomb mm-hmm. that they bring with them. I'm assuming it's at metal. I think the set actually ends up with it um, at the end of that book. Yes. But bombs, we know there's going to be some type of super powerful weapon in the lost metal. I'm guessing it's at metal. Now let's read this Word of Brandon, it's a back and forth with a questioner that goes by the name Iron Eyes. Would you like to play Brandon or the questioner, Iron Eyes? I'll be Brandon. Excellent. Quote, though it is a single element rather than a compound, the spiritual nature is not happy as it is. And you can set up in the physical realm through reactivity things that would just rip it apart. And really, your energy that is actually pulling from the spiritual realm And so that's why it can be so much more explosive than even the chemistry would account for. So it's not that the subatomic particles are invested. It's that they have a spiritual identity, which causes them to... Yes. So then it's not creating an oxide because after the spiritual energy goes away from the metal, right? Right. And... So you can't find harmonium oxide in the water afterwards. Right, 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 right. Because it's not... It's... Yeah, but you might be able to find something else, which is really relevant to the Cosmere and to Scadriel. So the core elements, the core particles, having extra repulsion causes them to have a nuclear potential. I would not call it nuclear because it's not the same exact thing, but there is a Cosmere equivalent to... You can release investiture from matter and things like that. So it's similar, but it's following its own rules that I have a little more that are controlled by me, right? But are built on this idea. So once you add... Unintelligible for a few syllables. That matter can now exist in this third state. You get all sorts of weird things, which one of the things that happens is you can get an energy release in the same sort of way. A reaction. I'm not going to call it a nuclear reaction, but of the same vein. End quote. Fantastic information from Brandon. Wonderful questioning and wonderful thought-provoking aspects of Et Metal. The comparison to a nuclear bomb, nuclear energy, is I think where a lot of people's minds went with that huge weapon that was presented and what was a big change in the 20th century In our world, it was World War II and the development of these weapons that can destroy everything. That seemingly would make sense for Scadriel. My question becomes more along the lines of this in the ways that it is not a nuclear reaction, in the ways that it is specific to the Cosmere, the ways that it is about opening the spiritual realm. Other, it doesn't produce an oxide, but it does produce something else that is really relevant to the Cosmere. I'm so like, in every... What could that possibly be? It has to be something, some aspect of harmonium, right? It's not an oxide. I mean, I guess. Yeah, it has some type of byproduct, I guess, that is... Cosmere significant. Yeah. So let's break this down because. So maybe it is just a function of like spiritual realm power or like some type of residual investiture. Like maybe it's not specific to harmonium, it's more specific to investiture or spiritual power. Okay. I like that idea. If we break this down, we're saying that in the physical realm, there's an et metal reaction. Yeah. In whatever form we want. But let's just take an et metal reaction. That's water and the metal itself. Big explosion. Mm -hmm. Brandon is saying 
that while there's not an oxide, because it's not purely a chemical reaction that's going mm-hmm. on, there's something produced in the explosion of energy, which is primarily coming from the spiritual realm, mm-hmm. not the physical realm. It's not a physical reaction. Right. What's left? We have physical, spiritual. Oh, cognitive? What if there's some hmm. aspect of the cognitive realm that's like on the way to pulling all of this energy? You pull some of the cognitive realm yeah, the, maybe into the it's physical? Like, yeah, it's like blurring the boundary between the physical and the cognitive in some weird way. In some weird way, yeah. That's exactly what I think, especially hmm. if this isn't, if this is a scadrial specific thing because of an aspect of scadrian lore that we've talked about a lot before where metals are the equivalent of souls they have similar potential energy on scadrial they're seen the same in the cognitive realm maybe a metal reaction like this has some bridging potential that is doing something we're unaware that's like causing a a weird portal, a mini perpendicularity Mm -hmm. type of thing. Maybe there's like cognitive realm dust that can then be harvested. (sighs) Really stretching now for something. But that's kind of what I think is going on is like punching a hole through the three realms. We see the explosion. So that's the spiritual realm energy. And Brandon's saying something is left over. And I'm just guessing that it's something from the cognitive. I think that's a good thought. My biggest thought about this whole et metal situation is that if this is Harmony's metal, it's extremely violent for a metal that we could call harmonium. Like, my, my, so aggressive. And it kind of makes me even more convinced that, like, Harmony's true intent is discord. And Sazed is, like, trying to make it Harmony, but maybe it really is discord and this is like our biggest indication that that is the case what brandon said about the spiritual realm intent being in conflict with itself exactly points to you know it's in discord with itself the real okay so this is big cosmere philosophy right now but maybe there's an aspect of why did the shards break into 16 We have lots of theories and potential answers about that, but maybe the simplest answer is that that is where they found the balance between each other. Yeah, like the most stable way to divide it was 16. Yeah. I know that there are some words of Brandon about like it could have been a different number Mm -hmm. and it also could have been broken into a different 16. Sure. Okay. It doesn't have to be those powers Correct. in that order. Correct. And it also could have been a different number. Yes. But I... That doesn't mean that like 16 wasn't the best for some reason. Mm-hmm. That's basically what I'm saying is that they found the... You, if you have all the power Ooh. of the mini universe... Okay. Sorry. If you have all the power of the mini universe, you will always let your partner tell you about her cool <laughs> idea first. Go ahead. I... Just thought if the spiritual aspect of harmonium is like so in conflict with itself that basically at any provocation it will come apart, Mm -hmm. essentially, you would think that harmony the shard would basically be the same way. So that Sazed is sort of preventing the inevitable, Mm -hmm. which is that these two shards are going to come apart like opposing magnets, Yes, right? Like you can try to shove them together all you want, and it might work for some length of time, but eventually they're just going to ricochet away from each other. And what he needs is an emulsifier. Ooh. You can't put just... Ruin and preservation together because they don't attract their Mm. water and oil. However, if you put a third shard in that mix, maybe it will soothe them, smooth them into being able to merge in a sustainable way. That is a great call. I like it a lot. I think that the introduction, of course, 
of a potential third shard yeah, on schedule. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if autonomy is really the one for that, but it it's seems for, to be it, the one that's that there. would be the one that's like being set up for it. What I like about that introduction as a concept is that it changes the way we see how shards interact. They're like a merging of what seems to be two shards that should work together, two Scadrian shards. Right. You're like, oh, two halves of a whole, basically. Exactly. Like they belong together. Yin and yang, as we yeah, talked about yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah. No, nonsense. That does not actually create balance. It creates et metal. It creates disharmony. It creates discord. For some reason, a balance can be found with potentially the introduction of a third shard or a yeah, third I mean, power. That's always the thing, right? And a lot of philosophies and mm-hmm. traditions and just basic old mathematics, like three is the number of stability. Yes. Right? You put three legs on your stool. Like you can't have just two, you will fall over. <laughs> <laughs> two compounds can be reactive, but you introduce that third one and you get a, a stronger alloy actually than just the two that you began with. I really like that call and I'm, it makes me hopeful instead of worried yeah, about exactly. the potential war of the shards. It's like, oh, it's totally fine. Like, we'll actually, just maybe this is a one good more. thing. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just bring it in. It'll be great. Instead of, you know, falling apart and becoming the Cosmere's number one enemy. Or Sazed is just going to keep fighting against it and be like, no, I must have harmony. And then everything will explode. <laughs> Take whatever path you want to go down. I am going to choose the one that leads to more life. <laughs> <laughs> and hope that Harmony is able to figure out this stuff. I just feel like Sazed is really being set up for like a fall from grace, which I know none of us want to see. We all love Sazed, but I feel like just all the signs are pointing to we thought he was great, but he's doing it wrong. What I'd like to wrap up this conversation on the Southern Scadrians with and kind of the look at their technology specifically and how it's going to impact the rest of the story and the lost metal specifically because we right now have just been talking a lot about et metal speculating on et metal but in i think it's shadows of self but it might be in the very first part of bands of mourning uh, because that's where i'm at in my reread wax goes to a party where there are a bunch of like fancy things presented on the walls different pieces of artwork Mm -hmm. and they're are intricate displays of each of the metals and like tells you a little bit about what the metals do and why they're important. And then there's a blank podium and it says the lost metal, ATM. Uh huh. We haven't seen ATM in a really long time. Yeah. We have not. I mean, I don't think it can exist anymore because it was Ruin's physical manifestation and Ruin no longer exists. You are correct about that. But what is preservation's physical manifestation? Laracium. Laracium, but he'd stopped making Laracium. Laracium beads did not continue to exist because preservation moved his physical body into the mist. Oh, right. Yes. And so the mist become his physical representation on the planet instead of a metal. What if, because we still have the mist in Era 2, there needs to be rogue Atium being developed somewhere? Mm. This is... More speculation back to the deniers of the mass. Basically, a concept of like, how would a group that had just experienced a cataclysm and had just experienced a very real presentation of like God's power, how would they react if then they got access to a metal ATM that allowed them to see many futures and and kind of like re-explore, re-understand, see Hmm. and experience things in a very powerful and different way. Yeah, I mean, we don't really see if ATM has like an actual future site type of property. We really only see it being used in an extremely limited way in like being able to see the future of what is immediately around you. Exactly. If that apple is going to fall from the tree or as we see it most often, of course, like which direction a person is is going to move like we don't see it giving people the ability to like hear what you're going to say next or to see very far into the future in a more esoteric way it's only been used very tangibly Mm -hmm. so i don't at least at this point we don't know that it could be used 
in the type of way that you're talking about. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing it more as like a potential way to explore the cognitive realm, the spiritual realm. And I mean, I would think this would more be along the lines of what we see in era one with the 11th metal, which we think is one thing, but it actually turns out to be electrum, Mm -hmm. you know, where like, we're going to see, we saw this plaque that said the lost metal, it's atium. And then they're going to find something that they think is the lost metal. And it's going to be something else. It will not actually be atium. Or the concept of at metal replacing atm and then that is the lost metal it's just Mm -hmm. like yeah you were using the old name for it and this is the new name ed metal has an incredible amount of potential but i think as we have indicated here it's hinting at a much darker story that's going on on scadrill and perhaps with everyone's favorite shard well this has been a bunch of information on the southern scadrians thank you for all of your attention and all of your focus we hope that you're able to use this in preparation for the lost metal. We're getting close now. And you are always welcome to throw out your ideas, thoughts, concerns on any of your social media sites. Until next time, Brooke, can you take us away? Life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. 